So I would like to ask first, do you think there is a serious lack of attention in modeling the education or revamping the education system in India? Though we have only addressed the engineering graduates issue, the, uh, the similar is the situation with the management graduates or um, other streams as well. So, and also we are left with the remnants of a structure left by the British oppressors, as Dr. Tarur has extensively spoken about this. Is there a serious concern to address the education system in India? If so, what do you think where we can start and what should be the direction? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matthew and AIPC. Before I comment on the question you raised, I want to first thank Dr. Karoor uh, for two things. One is that some years ago, when the Congress party decided to launch a new platform, the thinking was there for many years with the Congress president and with Mrs. Sonia Gandhi, but when finally it was decided to execute a creation of a platform where professionally engaged individuals can come and have debates, discussions and exchange of ideas. It was given the name and the task was given to Dr. Thurur. And I must tell you from an idea to where AIPC is today, uh, there were many people who were doubtful, including some in our own party who thought that this may not really see the light of day. But the fact that he along with the team have really created a structure in most parts of the country and it takes huge effort. I know I'm running an organization which is 130 years old, uh, the Congress Party. And despite that, we face challenges. But to start something new, to involve people who are inherently disenchanted with the political process. Professional people, young people don't have a very positive view of politics. And exactly to change that view was the creation of the AIPC so people could engage in a meaningful way. So I must compliment you, Dr. Guru, for having created this structure, sustaining it. And we are here today where AIPC has become a very well known, a very well respected, a very much talked about entity. So, congratulations for that and thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for coming. The question that um, uh, Matthew asked is it's not a new question, it's very pertinent. But I want to answer it in one when you say education, what strikes first to most Indian families and their children is jobs. Education is also about inculcating certain values. Now, when you have a curriculum or a syllabus designed to have two things. One, make young boys and girls employable once they graduate from school and colleges. That should be the primary task of a person designing the curriculum or a syllabus or academic layout for young people to study so they become gainfully employed and employable individuals. The other education is about the value systems of our culture, our heritage, our families, and all of that doesn't have to be from textbooks. But I can tell you that most of our education is unfortunately inclined towards handing out diplomas and degrees. Are you a 10th pass? Are you a double MA? Are you a BA pass, BCom? So what we do is we tout degrees. We tell people, family, friends, and relatives and neighbors that my son, my nephew, my grandson is a BA pass, is a MCOM, is a double MA. But we're not really focusing. When I say we, I'm talking about us as a nation. Should we not try and rethink what it is that I can teach my young so that the industry, the corporate sector, the, the companies, etc., can actually make use of that individual. So NASCOM reported some years ago, besides the report that you just heard, that only 25% of the engineers can actually be employed. If you see most of the top IT companies employ youngsters, have a six months training, reskilling, retraining on campus, and then they become actual assets for the companies. So we have to really think about what we teach our young people. So in my state of Rajasthan, I'm, we're trying to do two things. One, the corporate, the companies, uh, the business enterprises that are operating in the state, we want our professors, our faculty, our deans, our uh, university, uh, you know, chairmen, etc., to go engage with them. What it is should we teach our young people in our campuses so that you can employ them. So there is a huge dearth of talented, qualified people. We have tens, if not hundreds of millions of young people who get no jobs. There's a mismatch between what skills you require and what we're teaching in our classrooms. 
So we have to have a meeting of minds between what people require young people to have and what we actually teaching them. But the other aspect is that there is a large part of our country where the primary education is also not so rampant and universal. We have a law where our government passed that law, but that basic education should be given, I think, in a much more qualitative fashion. So today we open schools, you have a teacher and I'm telling you, Kerala, we're all very proud of what you've done here. But most parts of India, at least some parts of our, most of our states have that problem where quality primary education doesn't happen. And mind you, the dropout rate increases after class five. So I think even if you give a primary education to a, a family, especially girls and young boys, they'll be better able to manage themselves as they move on. So education, and I say this in many speeches that I've made in my semi Rajasthan, that when you talk about budgets and outlays and expenses, no education is actually an investment. So whatever money you spend in educating our young people, it's not an expense. It's not a budgetary allocation. It's actually an investment into our present and future. So we have to change the way we design our curriculum. We have to change our focus on what we want to achieve by giving this syllabus and curriculum. And in due time, I think young people of India deserve this. That are putting across, you know, putting aside political differences and governments and elections, etc. Education, good qualified individuals, quality teaching in our schools should be the top priority for a country as big and as young as India. Yes, Dr. Sadhu. Well, I agree with every word Sachin has said, but before I amplify on a couple of points, let me also make a, a brief introductory comment. We're very privileged to have Sachin Pilot here, and I have to say that I'm one of his strongest admirers and fans in the Congress party. I first met him as a young 26 year old when I was addressing a group of young global leaders in Germany, and he was the sole Indian there. And we got along very well. I was hugely impressed with his extraordinary maturity. And uh, I've since seen him uh, as a fellow member of parliament, as a member of the Council of Ministers, that's already been mentioned, the portfolios he held, and have followed him both from near and far as one of those rare politicians who has a tremendous intelligence and intellectual depth and rigor, at the same time, a very finely developed political sense, a good connect with ordinary people, an ability to work well within the organization. He led the Rajasthan Pradesh Congress Committee for five and a half years after it had been routed in both the Lok Sabha and the state assembly elections. It had been, it had, I think it was the worst defeat the Congress had ever suffered in Rajasthan. We lost every single Lok Sabha seat and all but 27 of the assembly seats. And Sachin built it up from there to a position where five years later, we now are the government of Rajasthan. And I'm proud to say that, uh, that he uh, does all this with a tremendous decency, humility, modesty. There's no arrogance about this man, as you can already see. Um, he is a joy to work with, a joy to meet. And I really think if I had to look at the future of Indian politics, I hope this is the face that for a very long time will be leading our party and our country in the right direction. So Sachin is somebody I'm very happy to have in Tiruvananthapuram because I think that his qualities are qualities we all appreciate. But here within the All India Professionals Congress, if there's anybody who thinks that he got his start only as a, a son of a political family, let me tell you that he too was a professional after his... Uh, studies, college studies abroad, Sachin worked for a couple of years before tragic circumstances brought him prematurely into the world of politics. So he knows what it's like to be a professional in a private sector firm, understand the dictates of market and consumers. And this is the kind of person whose um, orientation in politics, therefore, is, as you just heard, very much change oriented. One more comment, which uh, I, I would like to make as chairman of the All India Professionals Congress, is to congratulate Matthew, the AIPC of Kerala, the very many familiar faces here from AIPC for this excellent gathering, but also for the work you've done so far. You've been one of the most active and effective chapter uh, state chapters of the AIPC. And, and if I may say, there are some in this audience clearly who are not AIPC members, I would encourage you to join. The only way you can join is online. You've got to go on www.profcongress.com. Please do that because as far as we are concerned, we are open for expansion 
uh, we believe we are providing a useful service in the state and in the intellectual world of the country. And we hope you want to be part of it if you enjoy this event. Shabari, that includes you. You're a fully qualified professional having worked for Tata's. You should be in Professionals Congress also. Let me stress that, um, that Sachin said something very important that I think we need to build on. And I must say, Dr. Vijayalakshmi here led the uh, effort within the All India Professionals Congress of Trivandrum to have an education conclave to discuss precisely the future of education. She actually went to a level beyond where we are at now, but I hope we'll get to it because that's the future. But right now on the immediate present, I agree totally with Sachin and I agree with the findings of the study. Let me say that in my brief stint at HRD, I only had a year and a half there and the last half year was bedeviled by both the impending elections and the, uh, the crisis in Andhra Pradesh which distracted my minister understandably. So we, we had a good one year and that was about it in that time. But we diagnosed this problem that Sachin is talking about. And in a lot of my speeches from that era, I was saying exactly these things. We need at the school level to focus much more on learning outcomes than on textbook learning, rote learning, regurgitation of what the teacher tells you. you must encourage more creative thinking, get the children to ask more. And then at the college level, we absolutely have to add the factor of employability to our catechism. We had not done so in the past. It was always about expanding education. It was about um, incre increasing equity, which India has done a good job. People who were excluded from the higher education system for reasons of caste, of religion, of gender have been brought into the system. That's something we can all be proud of over the last 70 years. But we have not done enough about excellence and we've not done enough about employability. So that's important. We got a report from Dr. Narayana Murthy, the founder of Infosys, an excellent report on industry academia interface. How do you ensure that the universities and the industry collaborate closely with each other? Sadly, that report has been gathering dust under the BJP regime. It should have been implemented in full. One idea that we implemented in the short time we had was with regard to polytechnics, which as you know, are supposed to be in any case, producing not intellectuals, but people who can work in industry. We said under UPA that you cannot get a license to open a polytechnic in India unless you have a tie up with an industry within a 30 kilometer radius of your place of polytechnic. We don't want you setting up a polytechnic and having professors teaching from 30 year old textbooks, stuff that has no relationship to the real world. You want to teach mass communications, tie up with a television channel within 30 kilometers. You want to teach industrial engineering, tie up with an industry within 30 kilometers. Otherwise, don't, don't open a polytechnic, we won't allow you. That's the kind of thing we, Sachin is right. You go to Mysore, you'll see the Infosys campus. You go to the outskirts of Tirandapuram, you'll see the Tata Consultancy Services campus. These are not campuses for on the job training. These are campuses to educate their new recruits for six months to a year, very often a full year, to make up for the deficiencies of what they have not learned in college. Isn't that a disgrace? But that is the real reality. And I have to say that um, we do need to, we've got to move away from this bureaucratic regulatory mindset we've got in our country with the UGC rights to universities telling them how many classrooms they must have, what the size of each classroom must be, uh, how many acres of land they've got to possess, uh, how much faculty, what syllabus. Well, our system is over-regulated and under-governed. We need to reduce the regulation, give much more freedom to universities because that's from that freedom will come intellectual inquiry and academic success. And then we also need to make sure that overall governance focuses on things that really matter. Are you producing good, good graduates? Are you producing graduates who can stand up to the rigors of an international level examination system? Are you producing graduates and employers want to hire? Sachin said 25%. In fact, in some studies, because FICCI, ASOCHAM and CII all did studies, surveys of employers amongst their members as to whether they were happy with the quality of the engineering graduates. And as high as 82% in some surveys said they were not. And today, of the 500,000, 5 lakh engineers we graduate every year, 62% end up in jobs that do not require an engineering degree. So they've wasted their education, or the education was so bad it was irrelevant to what the real marketplace needs from an engineer. These things have to be fixed. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> moving from education to the second E, 
See, last parliament election... Sorry, I... Matthew, you're moving away from education. Let me briefly get into one aspect of the future because I would love Sachin's thoughts yeah, also on that. And that is, one of the things we came up with in our uh, conclave here in January was how rapidly things are changing. Artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, machine learning. The workplace is also changing. How do we transform our education system to make people ready for the workplace? There's a study from the Oxford Martin School that says that 30% of the jobs that exist in 2030 will be jobs that don't exist today. So the kids who are graduating in the next couple of years are going to go into a workplace where within 8-10 years their jobs may disappear and new jobs will come on stream that don't exist. What do you think Sachin? I think that's uh, inevitable. And when something is inevitable, it's best to ready yourself in the, in the optimal way possible. Now, 20 years ago, when computers were first coming into India, there were naysayers in this country which said that 20 clerks can do the same job as a computer. Why have a computer? Because 20 babus will lose their jobs. The now CPM that, sent yeah, yeah, yeah. to smash I, I don't want to take names. I thought it's a non-political thing, but that's true. A lot of our friends, our comrades did say that, you know, that 20 people will lose a job if a computer is put in an office. Now, at that time, that fear sounded real because the numbers were start, you know, uh, quite big. But here's the reality. Not only did India, at that time when Rajiv Gandhi was Prime Minister, did not we embrace it in the way that we should have? A 21st century India was ready and the same fear of losing jobs. Today, the IT sector is exporting hundreds of billions of revenues from India. We are gaining money from you know, more than 60 countries and tens of millions of jobs in the IT sector are being created in this country. Today, the whole world understands and realizes and accepts the potential and the strength of the Indian IT sector because we embrace that change much before time. And what uh, Dr. Tharoor is saying is absolutely true. Robotics, AI, all these things, you know, Internet of Things, it's pervasive. It's already going to happen. If it is going to happen, the best we can do for our young people is just let them be. If you make them dogged and archaic learning and you force our conventional way of education, you're not going to let the, the, you know, the imagination and the creativity flow. Young people, you know, I'll give you an small example. When I was growing up, color television came for the first time uh, in the Asian Games. I don't know if you remember, Shashi. That 82, yes, 82. I remember well. And when I was young, I was told never to touch the TV screen. It'll make that crackling sound if you meant to touch. Some of you are younger than me won't know this, but some of the older ones will know. You touch a TV screen, you were supposed not to touch it. Today, a child is born in six months, he's flipping on the phone, you know, because touch screens today are a reality. It's, it's become natural for people to do that. So in 20 years, the world has changed. And I can guarantee you next 10 years, the job market landscape will not be what it is today. There is no reason why our education system should not change accordingly. So I'm absolutely on board again, irrespective of governments and parties and ideologies, young people deserve a global education because today you're competing, not with people from Calicut and Chennai. You're competing with people from the Middle East, from the US, from Australia and Singapore. And global jobs, global competition, it's going to be even more tougher. So we have to embrace ourselves and these new concepts, the sooner we accept and faster we adapt, the better it is for all of us. Yeah. Well said. No, I agree with that. And in fact, uh, I think one of the ways we can prepare our youngsters better for that world is by moving away from giving them well-filled minds, you know, shoving textbook knowledge into their heads, into working for well-formed minds. Minds that are capable of dealing with unfamiliar information, but understanding them, getting to the essence of them, working with them. That kind of mind, which I think every politician probably has acquired instinctively, is something that every student needs to acquire to cope with things that today don't exist. You know, the big examination called life is going to ask you questions that you're not going to get out of the textbooks you've studied now. So I think we really need to absolutely prepare our children from the school days onwards for out of the box thinking, creative thinking, original thinking. That's got to be the major change in our education system. That's an excellent suggestion. So uh, moving from education. So having said all this, I hope uh, you all agree with me. During the last parliament elections, the, according to me, the ever biggest moving or attractive slogan given by the BJP was that, I mean, they offered uh, two crore jobs per year and in five years, 10 crore jobs were offered. And now we stand at a, I mean, the uh, data speaks to us saying that this country faces the biggest unemployment 
period now after 45 years. So this is the situation. So um, what do you think? How um, Congress is going to address this issue? Or uh, uh, there may be several reasons for the growth of unemployment, but last five years the economy has uh, taken a terrible hit, and there are a lot many things we can add on to it. But whatever it is, how we are going to tackle the same, and what solution or what kind of employment generation uh, you have in mind to offer to the youth of this country? Because they are terribly upset with the present situation. Matthew, the answer is very simple. It's not that complicated. Why is it that India is not producing as many jobs as we were doing even four or five years ago? One, people who run in this country don't really care so much about the ground realities. They believe emotions, rhetoric, propaganda will sail them through. Now, in the last five years, investments have taken a dip. The economy is growing only figuratively in numbers. I don't see, I've not met a single industrialist who's told me that I have now increased in my factory shifts from two shifts to three shifts. I'm hiring more people, I'm increasing wages. So that 6.5%, whatever GDP growth that government of India is talking about is purely numbers. On the ground, I don't see that 6% growth in our economy. Second is that when the investment climate is not conducive, when you have news coming out of this country about love jihad and ghar wapsi and what you eat and who you pray to, the kind of mob lynching, which company, which industry, which sector, which nation wants to invest in a country where they don't know how the social landscape will pan out in the next few years. And then you demonetize in the middle of the night one day. And for the life of me, I have not figured out till date, and or as the RBI, how much money actually was reported back in the banks. They're still counting that money. And what great benefits our nation derived from that one step, no one wants to answer. In fact, you question them, you ask them, Matthew, why you did this? You're called anti-national. The minute you say, why did you demonetize? And they said that large notes, Last denomination notes actually cause a lot of black money and corruption. So you stop 500 and 1000 and then you start 2000. So the logic is skewed. So when you do steps like that, when the regulatory framework is not stable, when there is acrimony in our political uh, narrative, you know, investments will dry up and jobs, I think, are created both with the government and the private sector. There is no reason for a country the size of India with kind of potential and opportunity that we offer that we should lose so many jobs. And when people are giving out data on how joblessness has increased, those people are forced to leave their jobs. So there is a oppressive hand. There is a very hard handed attitude and the economy itself, I don't think has been a, given that unleashing that it deserved to have gotten five years ago. So jobs are single big, to my mind, the single biggest problem in this country is young people being unemployed and underemployed. When I say underemployed, a double MA graduate applying for a clerical job in the government of India or state government. And I was reading somewhere the railways, there were 15 lakh jobs and 1.5 crore people applied for that job. It is a clerical job. We come job. across a report, engineering graduates applied for a super job in Tamil Nadu. So that means it's, even if you're employed, you're underemployed. And don't forget, for a low middle class income family to educate their boys and girls to go through college costs a lot of money. Not only are they wasting the degrees, look at the amount of money they put in educate their children and then they are getting a very suboptimal job. So underemployment, unemployment, the greatest, biggest challenge for a nation our size. Uh, I think the president of AIPC was talking about how India is a young country. It's a great asset, but if you don't really give it the direction it deserves, it'll be a biggest problem in 10 years time. Young people with so much time on their hands and what has the government done? I mean, I've heard of Digital India, Make in India, Stand Up India, Swatch India, 13 different slogans. How much of them have turned into reality? So we in the Congress party believe that A, we need a cost correction. We need to start thinking of not economy and investments and dollars and pounds, but also how many jobs you are going to get out. Um, you have to shift a large number of people who are working on the land, who are tilling the land to create economic growth from the farmland to the shop floor. Capital intensive industries have to my state of Rajasthan, we have mining, we have textile. So I'm trying to accentuate the growth in those areas where with the investments, also you get a lot of job creation and job creation can't happen in isolation. It has to have a passion in the minds of the policymakers. So today the, our policymakers are more worried about the community to which Hanumanji belongs to, <laughs> who you pray to, what clothes you wear. 
and all sorts of our uh, honorable chief minister of uttar pradesh the great personality so he he was campaigning in rajasthan where we had elections two months ago and i'm told he he didn't go to lucknow for 22 days he was campaigning all over rajasthan not talking about the governance model of uttar pradesh but talking about ali and bajrang bali and hanuman ji was from this community you are from that community that's the discussion so when you talk about these things you want to shift focus away from the job lack of jobs that we have today so i tell you that in my mind the next elections will be fought on two issues one on this massive agrarian distress the farmer suicide the agricultural shock that we all are facing today and the absolute joblessness that has been created in the last 5 years so we have to tackle both of them the congress party in the manifesto will come out very clear directions and policies on how we'll achieve that one of course mr gandhi has mentioned is the universal income that we want to give out to everybody in this country at least the poor people and that's again something of a narega but a step beyond that and that also i think applies to a large section of the urban poor and urban unemployed who we trying to focus now yeah i mean again every single word sachin says is absolutely spot on when you when you look really objectively at uh, some of the challenges facing there's an independent think tank called the center for the monitoring of the indian economy they said that in the last year alone the country has lost not gained lost 1.1 crore jobs so not only have the 2 crores a year not been created 2 crore jobs have not been created but existing jobs have been closed down demonetization had a terrible shock on the economy because a lot of small micro enterprises that functioned on daily cash flow that probably didn't have bank accounts and online transactions were working in people exchange notes or small services i'm talking about little places of 2 3 5 6 7 employees that's it many of them closed down in tamil nadu you know the government is an ally of the bjp in the center the industries minister of tamil nadu confessed in the state assembly on the record last summer that tamil nadu alone had had 50000 small scale industries shut down in the last year this is no small joke even if each of these 50000 employed just three people that's already you're looking at a lakh and a half jobs lost in one year in one state can you imagine what the condition of the country as a whole is like so there is no doubt about the fact that this government wants to proceed with numbers which seem to bear no relation to reality in fact economists have told me it's one of the great mysteries of global economics that a country where exports are down manufacture is down agriculture is stagnating every single indus and jobs of course have gone apparently is growing at 6.6% how no one knows so there's some real doubt about this and sachin rightly said in substitution of any reasonable discussion argument we have slogans digital india make up india start up india stand up india sit down india and shut up india if you disagree is what they really all about so let us be very blunt about this there are some there's some serious accounting to be done sachin rightly said the issues facing the country in the next election are principally agrarian distress lack of jobs the economy is very very bad shape when it comes to real experiences of real people forget the statistics of the government likes to throw about what are real people is experiencing you go and ask an audience anywhere in india have achhe din come for you practically no one can point to any achhe din for themselves so in these circumstances the reality is that we are facing a country which is in throes of crisis and this is why before pulwama we actually saw all the polls showing the bjp dropping well below a level at which they could have aspired to form the government again that's why they desperately trying to make this a national security election i mean i'm mystified that the media is playing along with this given that when a tragedy happens in our country it actually is a government failure not a government success to boast about how can a government go on saying we are the only ones who can keep you safe when there are 40 coffins proving otherwise but this is the ground on which they want to compete and we don't want to give them that satisfaction so that's why you're not seeing the congress party going on a great length about all of that because sachin is right election is to determine the future of india is to deal with real problems of real people and is also got to be focused on what ordinary people are choosing a government for we can't let smoke and mirrors illusions public relations slogans dictate the future that our young children are going to be growing up with 
Uh, Sachin, as you uh, rightly pointed out, the one of the major concern or issue presently in the country is the huge agrarian distress that we are facing. Since your father, father has been a champion of the courses of farmers and you also hails from such a background and a state where in which farmers uh, contribute to the national building in such a big way. And uh, I would point out that I don't know whether you have come to your, you have come to your notice. Eight farmer suicide happened in Kerala in one district in last two months. And the opposition leader is sitting on a fast today for the whole day in Idiki district to highlight this issue. So what this can has never just, happened before, but we've never had farmers. Never, never such a thing. So this magnitude of agrarian distress is so huge. So could you just uh, throw some perspectives on uh, how and why this much, I mean, agrarian distress has uh, come to this country? See, and India basically is an agricultural economy. 66% of our nation is employed on the farmlands, but we only contribute 13% of our GDP. Now, when you have a situation like that, somehow I think our media does not believe in putting that state of affairs to the forefront. And I'm saying this very openly because this issue, you talked about farmers committing suicide in Kerala for the first time. In Rajasthan, which is a drought prone state, out of the 70 years, we had 55 years of drought. Even then, Farmers were never forced to kill themselves. In the last four and a half years, we had more than 200 farmer suicides. Now, a small farmer with a small borrowing is killing himself or herself. It's something that no civil society can accept. This is a situation of epic proportions. It's not about one state or you know one community or one region. Pan-India agricultural, forget about being profitable. It's not even sustainable. They need long-term situation and analysis and course correction, but we need immediate intervention to stop this from happening. And to my mind, giving 2000 rupees to a farmer in his bank account is not going to solve the problem. For 2000 rupees, you can't even fill the diesel in your tractor, a full tank of it. And that's the kind of solution that Honorable Prime Minister is coming out with only because elections are down the corner. If he had real intentions and felt the pain of the farming community, then five years ago, when he first took charge, he should have done something. So today we would not be in this situation. I'm not pointing fingers and putting blame. I'm just asking for accountability because today the people who are running this nation are supposed to be very, very muscular in their policy making. What happened to your muscular policy making for the farming community? So all over India, when farmers are killing themselves, we need to really introspect as to whether the 6% GDP growth rate, India having the third, fourth, fifth largest economy in the world, is it really the country we want to see? So large portion of our nation remains behind because we are not able to take them along. They have to be long-term measures and short-term measures. In Rajasthan, we've waived off 19,000 crore worth of farm loans because we felt that we had to intervene. People say it's a bad economic choice. I don't agree with that. When a patient is brought to you at the ICU in a hospital emergency room, you don't put band-aids on it. You first try and revive the patient, make sure that he lives or she lives, and then you administer the medicine and see you know, what long-term uh, medication can be given. So we are at that crisis situation where this needs to be addressed. First of all, it has to be accepted. Today, a lot of our people in Delhi are living in denial. Farmers' movements in Maharashtra, in Karnataka, and Rajasthan, lakhs of people marching on the foot voluntarily towards state capitals and demonstrating in New Delhi outside Rashtrapati Bhavan in, in very horrific circumstances it still does not melt the hearts of people who are running the show today. So they really have to take first a cognizance of what's happening. And second, be honest about it. Have an all party meeting, get ideas from people from different ideological parties, and then have a national policy that everybody's on board. But you can't politicize you waiver farm loans in Uttar Pradesh and Maharashtra. That's a good policy. When I do it in Rajasthan, they say this is all false and this is all wrong. You can't be like that. And that's the kind of mindset that needs to be changed. And I'm sure that all of you will help us do that in the month of May and June. We have to replace that government and get a new one, which is the UPA government. You must have something I think there's nothing to add to this excellent answer that Sachin gave. These are the points that honestly we all have to stick to. Also, uh, my father was the first generation of his family not to be involved in farming. So I better not. I better yield place to the, uh, to the one who's closer to the sons of the soil right yeah. now. See, um, and now uh, these elections, unfortunately, we are seeing the trend that, uh, that this national security 
was been brought into the political debate in an unprecedented manner and one government and prime minister and this uh, bjp and sankaparivar seems to be celebrating this national security issues in an unprecedented way and uh, brought into the domestic politics and uh, what would be the uh, what i, I would uh, like to taru to respond to that first i mean what would be uh, how to deal with it then definitely it's a double edged sword i mean we, we can't deny it because at one end when we are facing a crisis uh, we all stood together we have to stand together we stood together and later when if any questions are been raised then immediately you are made an anti national so the, such a disturbing trend is developing in the country and how to tackle it and um, uh, what is your views on it less precisely the challenge i think is that frankly we are looking at uh, uh, a, a dilemma for any opposition party because we are all indians first and the country comes first beyond any shadow of a doubt for us uh, we 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 want uh, to speak as much as possible in one voice and i have often argued even as chairman of the foreign affairs committee of parliament that uh, there is no congress foreign policy or bjp foreign policy is only indian foreign policy india's place in the world but this government has made it very hard for us to be non partisan because of their blatant politicization of issues of uh, of national security and of foreign policy they have turned everything to their political advantage in the most shameless way and frankly we have never seen in our country a political party campaigning with images of coffins or of jawans and soldiers the jawans don't belong to any particular party they serve the nation the flag belongs to the country not to the prime minister of the day but there is this dangerous belief in this party that first of all the prime minister is the party the party is the government the government is the nation therefore if you criticize even the prime minister you're anti national that cannot be a basis for democratic discourse but sadly they having made it that way means that there is no longer any respect you just saw many of you may have seen on whatsapp as a clip going around where a journalist who had broadly been known as sympathetic to the government asks a bjp minister to explain the discrepancy between the government's claims uh, on what happened uh, in the strike on balakot and the um uh, claims by international media and and pakistan that in fact no damage was done some trees were hit that no fatalities occurred etc and he just asked very politely and respectfully as i said he's known as a relatively pro bjp uh, anchor and you know what he got he didn't get a reply on the substance he got an attack on him for asking the question how dare you challenge the uh, armed forces of our country when no one is charged with challenging the armed forces we are all greatly respectful of the armed forces many of us have direct connections i have a brother in law serving in the army many of us are i mean kerala is actually in terms of percentage of population represented in the armed services kerala is second to none we have a very proud record of serving the the country and protecting its security but that doesn't mean we have to suspend our intellectual faculties or put our brains in a blind trust when it comes to discussing matters of national security the nation is all of us and so security is of all our people and if we have grounds to ask questions it's the government's duty to be accountable to the nation for security just as much as they have to be accountable to the nation for agricultural distress for misgovernance for bad stewardship of the economy all of those things have to be accountable for i must say that this is the the dilemma we have is the opposition has legitimate questions and concerns on aspects of both national security and foreign policy but is particularly careful in the way it expresses them not because the doubts don't exist but because we don't want to give these people an easy opportunity to tarnish any legitimate question as anti national and this dilemma is what partly makes the opposition perhaps less outspoken than many of you would desire on some of these issues because after all the country for us comes first and let me say that since the country comes first let us also look at the larger and not play into the blatant chauvinism even jingoism that this government is trying to promote by its misuse of the flag misuse of the uniform misuse of the national security imperative 
to cloak itself in some sort of false glory as defenders of the nation. We are as much defenders of the nation as anybody else. They happen to be in power. They have been entrusted with the responsibility of uh, guiding the army, guiding the security forces, and they should be accountable for the decisions they have taken or failed to take in national security as well. Yes, okay. I agree with the, most of what Dr. Tharoor has said. You know, I remember the speech uh, Mrs. Sonia Gandhi made once the parliament was attacked uh, when Bajpayee was Prime Minister of India. And she said to him and to the house and to the whole country that the attack on our parliament is an attack on the temple of our democracy, it's an attack on India. So Mr. Prime Minister, I urge you to take any or whatever action you deem fit. My party, this parliament and this nation stands with you in any rebuttal you want to create or any action you want to take to give those people a, a, a blistering message. And that is a sense of nationhood and unity that anybody would have given at that time. So when our soldiers are attacked, when our national security is challenged, when our internal security is threatened, it's not about Danta Dal and BSP and BJP and Congress. It's about this nation. And our armed forces, the valor, the bravery, it is second to none. They are, in fact, I think, the most professional, the most dedicated and the most brave people on this planet Earth. And whatever they do has the fullest backing of 1.3 billion people and more. So there should be absolutely no debate, discussion or doubts on that front whatsoever. Personally speaking, my grandfather was in the army, my father was in the Air Force, I'm a commissioned officer in the TA, and I think nationality, loyalty, love for our country flows in our veins. It is not because you're a politician or a professional or from this party or that party. This country is ours and everyone's equally. So therefore, there is no question of doubting anything that any of our men in uniform do or say. What happens is when we fall victims to propaganda, which is sometimes false, sometimes not so true. And there is an illusion being created. So anybody who talks about the opposition or the BJP right now is asking the wrong question. Because when you give a resounding reply to those state actors who have acted against India, any individual, any organization, any nation state, that dares to look at India in the wrong way will be given a befitting reply today and for all times to come, whether who's in government is not important. Whoever is Prime Minister of India will and should take that stand. But it's not about the BJP or the Congress. It's the government of the day. It's the armed forces, which are sacrosanct. There is a spectacular convention in this country. When it comes to things beyond our border, we all are one. I happened to be in the US when the Pulwama attack happened just a day after that. I was giving a talk at Harvard. And I was asked this question. I said, look, I am on foreign soil today as a member of the Congress party, but as an Indian citizen, whatever we do next will be done unanimously, unitedly. And those sitting outside of India must realize that we have our differences, CPI, CPM, BJP, Congress, we'll fight out election, we'll win and we'll lose. But for India, we are one, our voice, our army, and our soul is one. So don't try and change that. But when Mr. Yadurappa says that post that incident, BJP will get 25 seats in Karnataka. And today yeah. the Jharkhand chief minister said they'll get 14, all 14 now seats that, in See, even if you think like that, I would urge them not to speak like that. Because you're exposing yourself. You're, you're not wanting to answer questions of economic crisis, jobs, inflation, joblessness, farmers crisis, middle income groups having disenchantments with you. You want to try and use the valor of the armed forces to cover up your shortcomings as a political party in the, in the ruling dispensation. That I think is not appropriate. Yadu Rapaji is saying that. What does it say to you? The first person to salute our Indian Air Force was the Congress president. And the people in uniform don't belong to any party. In fact, one of the great distinctions in this country is that even in South Asia, any country, take example, Bangladesh, China, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, the armed forces and the political dispensation are quite intertwined. It's only in India that our political class and our institution of the armed forces has remained absolutely sacrosanct and different from each other. Change in power happens seamlessly. The transition happens seamlessly. 
So there has been that tr wonderful tradition being held for 70 odd years. You must respect that tradition. Therefore, the elections will not be fought on emotions of Ram Mandir, of Masjid, of Hindus and Muslims, of beef ban, of not eating, not wearing, not praying, and of our army, Navy, and Air Force. It will be fought on the bread and butter issues that trouble people of India. And no matter what the popular media might try and create, Indian voters are far more sophisticated. So at, on election day, the votes will be cast on the accountability of the government of India, what the BJP has said and what it has not done. And if, even if it's the Prime Minister or Mr. Amit Shah, they have to be answerable for their five years of performance rather than cloak and hide behind you know, the bravery of a few. That, I think, is not the right way to do politics. Okay, thank you. See, <clears throat> I am running out of my time. So the floor will be open very soon. Before that, my last question and my most important question to you. See, here is a crowd which we gather with tremendous energy, a lot of ideas, vision. And unfortunately, as a political party or as a political leader, we are unable to make use of that energy for the national building process. I would say rather than politics, I would say in the national building process, as you rightly said, the professionals are so disentangled with political idea or politi political activity. We are trying to bridge somehow the uh, gap, existing gap. So I uh, seriously really would like to, uh, you to reflect upon Congress. We have come up with this platform. So what is your message to the professionals, especially young professionals? They are so enthusiastic. And they are so excited to be part of any movement, um, any creative movement. But how and in what way Congress party will give that space? Because everything is about, I mean, it's not about um, political space alone, but how you recognize, how you assimilate, how you accommodate their views and all. So how we will, um, uh, how uh, in the coming days, as we are looking at you as a young leader and the future, um, future leader of the party as well as the nation. How Congress party or how the politics of the national building process will stream this energy to the entire political activity. Should I go first? I'll be brief about this. Well, the fact that the Congress party right from the top has this desire that we must try and get as many people who are well qualified, who have certain set of principles and convictions to come into the mainstream of politics. This has been the desire of the Congress party and its president for a few years now. And that's why you've seen the AIPC where we are today as a fallout of that, um, of the desire that the Congress party has. I think there's no greater example of a person being completely professional and then turned completely political than Dr. Shashi Tharoor. You know, he, I, he was talking about when I first met him in uh, Germany, 2004, I think it was. So I first met Dr. Tharoor. First of all, I refuse to believe he's a Malayali because he was speaking, you know, nothing, everything but Malayali. And then when I met him, he was, you know, very nicely dressed. So he had, you know, good three decades of a spectacular career at the UN as a foreign diplomat. And uh, the transition, and, and he did express a desire that, you know, he wants to join politics at that time. I had already been elected as a member of parliament and I was thinking, I said, what is he thinking? Sitting here in Hamburg, you know, wearing this nice suit and he must have joined Lok Sabha of all things. You know, that. So I actually was a bit unsure of what he was trying to say. But the fact that he decided to take the plunge from a completely professional field, nothing to do with the politics of Trivandrum or Kerala or Congress at that point, to change from that. And I've seen him transform from that to a Mundu wearing, Malayali speaking, absolutely Carter based congressman in, in Trivantaburam. It's a, it's a huge change, but I think it's a good example for people who believe they're gainfully employed as a professional. And then because of what you believe and the fact that you can contribute something meaningful to politics, you take part in a party activity and, and there are many, many more. So today we know about him because he's, you know, quite well known. I can tell you about hundreds, if not thousands of people in the Nagar Palikas, in the municipalities, in the panchayats, in Gram Sabhas, in Zilla Parishads, who are young people who are qualified lawyers, doctors, engineers, architects, etc., who are now taking on these leadership challenges at a very young age. In Rajasthan, we've given a lot of tickets, young people who were professionally qualified people, having small businesses, doing some small things. I've actually worked uh, for a brief while uh, near Delhi in General Motors. So there was an automotive component 
manufacturing company. And why I'm going back to my first point of how we must link our education to what the job requires you to do. So my graduation was in English literature. Uh, even though my English is not as exceptional as Shashi Tharoor's, but I did study English for three years. And I was then doing a job in a OEM manufacturing, car manufacturing American company in Gurgaon, selling uh, toolkits and gearboxes and HVAC and air conditioners to uh, large manufacturers. So that job required me to have different skill sets. I had to learn very quickly in the first few months to be able to not embarrass myself when I was making my PowerPoint presentations to the board. Then I did work for the BBC radio for some time, but I, it's important for people to know what an office environment feels like. You know, the sense of professionalism and the sense of humility, which sometimes is lacking in politics. I think it's important to be in that pecking order, to take orders, to execute things without saying you know, anything back. Um, but it's important that professionally qualified people start taking not all the space, but at least a part of the space in, in all political parties. I, I think we're moving uh, very quickly towards that. And the Congress party certainly is ahead of the pack in that sense. In that yeah. Dr. Taru. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you, you raised no, a question. Sorry, uh, before passing on the mic to Taru, I would say, I had given one word that I'm in, in APC meetings, I will ensure that 100% participation will be from professionals. I won't, I mean, I, I don't say that the, uh, I have no, I, won't, I'm, I have some problem with others, but I'm uh, giving you the word that everyone participating here is some way or other way in a profession and otherwise in a professional college student. And I would say that Tarur has always given unflinching support and great inspiration to bring professionals to uh, APC and Congress. So definitely I think, but I feel Congress party assets need to be more open, more wide hearted to have them and to make use of them. That is my initial. So that, that was exactly where I was coming in. You know, this time for our Congress party manifesto, uh, I'm on the manifesto committee. We conducted nationwide consultations. That is that we broke up the main issues in the manifesto into about 20 topics or 19, I think it was. And we asked senior party leaders to consult experts on one or two assigned topics. I was assigned the topic of the environment and, uh, and forest issues, as well as the topic of culture, media, arts, freedom of expression. And I must have held at least a dozen consultations with different groups in many places. Very often these were experts. So AIPC itself helped me organize many of these consultations. So AIPC Bangalore brought together about 100 leading environmentalists in one place. It's an amazing discussion, their suggestions. Uh, AIPC Mumbai brought together a smaller group of equally distinguished environmentalists in Bombay. So this kind of thing <coughs> we found very, very useful. And it's a way of getting professional inputs into the Congress party manifest. And obviously we got hundreds of ideas. We can't use all of them. I've given my input based on these consultations. Other leaders have done the same thing based on their consultations. And the manifesto leadership will be putting it together and the Congress working committee will approve it. But you need to know that in this process, the views of professionals and experts are deeply infused into whatever the Congress party. This is not a bunch of politicians sitting and thinking, oh, what position will bring us votes? It's really a party saying which issues matter to people, what do knowledgeable people about a subject want the party to do if we come to power. And I think you will find that in this area, we're in pretty, pretty uh, unusual company because traditionally other parties have entirely entirely written manifestos uh, for the purpose of quite simply vote catching. Secondly, on the other point Matthew made about professionals and, and politicians being apart from each other, Sachin gave a very kind ex uh, example of myself, but let me stress for all of you, I recognize that the vast majority of professionals who are interested in politics don't necessarily want to become politicians. Perhaps even within the IPC membership, there may be no more than, no more than five, maximum 10% who actually would like one day to be a full time in politics. Most of them are the kinds of people who are happy in their jobs, doing a good job, paying their taxes, and then coming home and complaining about the politicians. All we're saying to them is don't sit around complaining about the politicians, do something about it. Don't abdicate the opportunity we are giving you to let us hear your ideas and concerns. AIPC is a kind of rotary club within the Congress party. But your ideas, which by the way, we leave you a complete free hand as to what you want to discuss, 
each chapter can take up its own issues. No one told AIPC Kerala to study engineering education. No one has told uh, uh, AIPC Tamil Nadu to do what they did, which is to do a very interesting study of the impact of GST and demonetization on the Tirupur garment industry. Terrific, terrific report, which I launched in Chennai a few months ago. All that uh, AIPC Delhi did a study on air pollution, which again was very useful. Um, there's uh, another group working on metro travel in the, metro, in the metropolitan cities. There's another AIPC group working on fire safety in apartment buildings, all sorts of, it's completely up to what they think is important. And we leave you that freedom and you give us the feedback, it will reach the political levels of the party. We want you to feel involved in the future directions of the country. Equally, as I said, it works both ways. When it comes to writing a manifesto, we seek your inputs. And when it comes to your having suggestions or criticisms, we welcome those suggestions and criticisms. This is the way we can go. I've, I've been writing for years before coming into politics about the fact that in many Western democracies, professionals are the mainstay of democratic politics. But in India, for the most part, we stay aloof. I grew up in a middle class household. My parents were very strict. You study hard, pass your exams, get a good job. Politics is for those who can't pass the exams. That was the attitude. The problem is if you take that attitude, then ultimately you are leaving this field for people who may not be worthy of representing you by that standards. Secondly, politics has to represent all sections of society. You need grassroots leaders, you need farmers, you need trade unionists, you need all of those people, but you also need professionals. Why should professionals be the only ones who stay out? Why should they abdicate their responsibility to contribute to the future of the country through its politics? So AIPC seeks to be a bridge that will connect professionals and politicians together. And at the same time, we've given you concrete examples of how we can move forward. I really hope that the kind of question Matthew asked today will no longer be necessary to ask in a few years because it will be taken for granted that professionals have as much right, as much claim to the attention of politicians as politicians need the ideas, knowledge and expertise of professionals. Thank you both, uh, Tarur and Sachin. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I apologize for the extra five minutes which I took. Now the floor is open for discussion. I would request the court time chapter president Vinu and also Fasilu to kindly coordinate the floor. And I would say that let the, the let there be one question from one, uh, and the question be precise and try to minimize the time. So that's it. I would request Fasilu and. I think I will we'll start for, with uh, Belram. I mean, he's there. He's I think, the most, I think in all the fairness, most popular. I mean, we have uh, about 20 minutes 20 tops, minutes. maybe 15. Because he's the uh, most popular um, um, MLA in our state. And he's a, uh, he's not only, he's a BTEC, LLB, and MBA. A rightly graduated professional. And my dear friend. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Matthew for making this conclave happen and i congratulate the whole team apc for this wonderful effort they have taken and uh, thank you mr sachin and dr taru for putting your views across uh, though you are young maybe we are of the same age group but you have tremendous exposure and you have tremendous understanding about how things actually work on the ground so you were right in uh, telling uh, us that uh, we have been facing challenges from across the border. So our country is one of the world's mightiest fighting forces. Uh, we have the biggest uh, uh, military uh, perhaps in this part of the globe. So we are always ready to meet up to any challenges which is posted from beyond our borders. And as you have rightly said, we are all united uh, to fight our enemy. But there are bigger challenges which are uh, from inside our borders. India is a democracy, and the biggest challenge to Indian democracy is not maybe uh, from uh, our enemies, but from within. Uh, our institutions are under challenge. All their credibility, 
uh, all their uh, all the faith uh, they uh, so far enjoyed is being um, tarnished and they are being attacked so uh, i am specifically pointing at uh, the ideologies uh, which uh, uh, do not believe in democracy which do not believe in making india a plural uh, democracy as such uh, so uh, these organizations especially the sangh parivar and the rss uh, you have been saying that uh, many youngsters of our country are driven to their ideologies in spite they are not liberal uh, they are not democratic they are not progressive in spite of that you can see many youngsters being driven to their fold so how can we address that challenge basically how as an ideology congress can uh, campaign ourselves and make our uh, ideology more marketable uh, how can we sell our ideology uh, more effectively to the youngsters so that uh, we can ideologically challenge the rss and the sang parivar see marketing and selling only works if the product is good and i'm of the opinion that there is no harm in the rss or the bjp or whatever vhp or they have organization and this is a large country there is space for all thoughts and ideologies as long as it's within the constitution there is no violation of law and order and uh, they can propagate their ideology i don't think the congress party has ever said that we want to have a bjp free india that's not the kind of politics we practice it's okay for people to have their ideological differences and they can have their own uh, propaganda etc the people of india have to see through that and see that which party which background what leadership what thought process suits us the most it's a majority wins it's a first past the post in the elections there are about 40 parties in parliament uh, all shades and all color uh, from all parts of india it's absolute and i think maybe i differ with you i think it's absolutely fine for people to have different thoughts um what you said how can we propagate ourselves more is by example and we have to be we have to prove ourselves to be better than the competing ideology uh, there will be people who will still believe in that ideology so let it be as long as this country is on the right direction there can be a few difference of opinion but within the framework of our law and order our constitution and propriety as long as that is in full sanctity i think there is no reason why we should think of finishing or eradicating or not having a competing ideology is absolutely fine so let's work on ourselves and let's make our thought process much more widespread much more palatable much more acceptable and that we can only do by leading from the front leading by example we must show progressive nature we must show open mindedness we must show successes of our policies i'm sure more people will embrace it as time goes by my question is to both of you dr shashi and mr sachin in your political career till date did you undergo any conflict in mind a uh, conflict the sense in dealing with a situation or an event in such a way between the professional politicians in you and the human being in you and if so how do you deal with that thing and how have you dealt with that thing well i mean sachin's experience in politics is much longer than mine though he's much younger than me but in my own case i honestly wouldn't say that's happened simply because i genuinely try to make my politics an extension of myself that is that i i try and behave in politics as i would as a normal human being would behave in certain situations the only thing is that politics gives me a bigger platform a more public platform and a megaphone to express my views but i would feel that if my views in politics were completely different from what i genuinely believe or do then frankly my integrity would be gone and my sincere involvement uh, in politics would be in question so for this reason i've tried to be consistent uh, very rarely there have been occasions when i for example found it wiser politically not to say something i believed than to say it and either hurt colleagues in the party or hurt people or cause any offense uh, and that's again a choice you make because as a human being you don't want to hurt people but also as a politician and a party member you feel a certain obligation to take certain positions and um, that apart when it comes to policies that affect people's well-being i genuinely try and think 
not through the prism of ideology. And that's one good thing about the Congress party. We don't have a rigid straitjacket the way the communists have or the RSS, BJP has, where everything is seen through. For the BJP and RSS, everything is seen through the prism of communalism and, and communal bigotry. For the CPM, everything is seen through the prism of class struggle and the primacy of the party over any human values. I mean, why is it that they can kill people for their ideology? Because for them, all other moral considerations are irrelevant. Congress will never expect anyone to kill anybody out of support for the Congress party because our morals include respect for human life and respect even for the, the views of people we don't agree with. So from, to my mind, as long as you keep, keep to those normal moral human values that animate you as an individual, then you can be consistent in your politics. And that's what I've tried to be. My answer is far less intellectual. And I'm, I, I want to be as honest as I can this evening. So you said, how is there a conflict between what my politics expects of me and my professional aspect now and the human, and the human aspect? Well, that, okay. So supposing a, a person comes to me, someone who I may or may not know is seemingly very poor, for example, and he wants me to call somebody to get him a bed in the hospital because there is a queue. And the dilemma I'm facing is, that I might call the doctor or the hospital to favor him in getting that bed because he's in a serious situation. He wants that emergency uh, help. Now, I have no way to figure out whether by making that poor sick man jump the queue, am I depriving the deserving one who should be next in queue? Now, that's a moral dilemma. Now, I because this man and family, and I've seen this many times, especially for medical cases, that you expect it to make a phone call. And, you know, sometimes because of short of supply, you have to oblige people who you see in front of you. Am I hurting the chances of a more deserving person who's perhaps more sick or even more poorer? I don't know. But what I see is that as a duty as a politician, as an MP, as an MLA, as a minister, whatever, I want to help who I'm seeing right now because it's deplorable. If I make that phone call, I'm, my conscience is feeling good because I've helped somebody in need. But am I taking away the right of someone who would have got it had I not made the phone call? Now, it's a very small thing. Because some of us politicians still have a conscience left, I do think about it. That I'm calling to make this favor for this person who deserves it in my view, but am I depriving the other guy who may be more deserving at that point? I don't know. And then you have favors, you know, political party associates, people who worked for you, they want you to call for admissions, transfers, promotions. You know how phone calling and recommendations work in this part of the world. And you're always stuck in that moral dilemma. As a professional, does he or she deserve it? Do political considerations make me make that phone call or not? So it's, I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a battle every day that we have, but it's certainly something that I think about a great deal, uh, just as a human being. I do make the call sometimes. Sometimes I make a half-hearted phone call. Sometimes I make a very passionate phone call, depending on the situation. But these are small things I think most politicians, whether some of them admit or not, but I'm sure they face this. And perhaps even for bigger things, I'm giving examples of, you know, school admissions or hospital bed availability or worst case scenario. Sometimes there is lack of blood available for a particular patient and you get a frantic phone call saying, please call the blood bank and get me a, a bottle of blood. Now, how do you make that choice of who deserves more? So anyway, I'm just giving this example because when you were asking the question, these thoughts were running through my mind. I thought I'll share with you. But more than that, I agree with what Shashi Thiruji has just said. If I don't believe in what I'm saying and doing, A, I'll never be good at it. And B, you can see through it that I'm only saying it because I have to say it. You have to believe what you're saying and you can't really passionately follow what you're saying unless you really believe in that. So if you're not clear about what you believe, you can't uh, expect other people to follow a direction than yours. Is. So I don't, I don't take up issues where I don't strongly feel about it. And once I do, then I do it with my full dedication and passion. Let me just add, if I may, one thing to what Sachin said, because I thought he touched an absolute nerve or a chord because every politician goes through the same dilemma. Early on in my UN years, I faced the same dilemmas about humanitarian aid. And I came to the conclusion, the world is full of people in suffering and need. If I don't help you because that person whom I don't know might deserve the help more, then I'm not doing any favors either to that person or to you. So my logic is, Help the person you can, because even if it's only a drop in the bucket, 
that drop will make a difference to somebody's life. I'm sorry that there are others still suffering who I'm not helping because you came to me and they didn't. But that's life. And since the world is unfair anyway, let the unfairness work for the good of someone rather than neglecting everybody else in need. So I have no moral dilemma on that. I help. I'm Dr. E.G. Rashid and I am LIC, LIC General Secretary at Tingle. I'm so happy and proud to be inside this dais, especially in front of our Belra Maiden, our Tarur ji and uh, Matthew ji and Sachin ji. First of all, why I uh, told about Belra Maiden is while I, I was preparing for civil service, he had helped me a lot. And uh, my question, I have to uh, mention three things. Is, first one is, see, uh, I passed out in 2010. Now it has been 2019. I had seen that the professionalism, ha uh, professionals in politics have been two categories. That is active professionals in politics and passive professionals in politics. Well, we are, uh, if any uh, national happenings or uh, things happening, well, we are going through the comments in uh, FB. We can notice that so many good comments are coming from the passive professionals who were pro attitude to Congress. But unfortunately, we were not finding uh, those persons and we were not promoting that ones. Uh, so could you please tell me um, anything regarding that first thing? The second thing I want to tell us, see, uh, the, here's so many persons are there. So many have so many ideas. I think this is uh, this time is not at all enough for them to explain their criteria, their, their uh, talkings to you people. So kindly to create a platform either by online or otherwise it's a uh, they, then 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 they can express what they can and thirdly as you told sachin ji sachin ji told earlier that uh, he used to answer calls so i have a personal experience but i don't know whether he's remembering before four years back i am a, a state project coordinator in kerala state youth commission i made a call to him for inviting a meeting i called it i think in morning uh, his secretary might have been taken but at around seven o'clock he called back and told uh, he called back and i was so wondering because he he himself called back so I was so I, I was so wondering and I was trembling my hands and he was telling I am not there when I come to Kerala definitely uh, he will come to the program so my I want to please answer these two questions what is the criteria you are being doing for the passive professionals and also the active please kindly uh, arrange a platform for all these professionals what they have to tell to you thank you I don't know if I got all of your questions but. I think there's a platform available already. I don't know how to distinguish between passive and not so passive. If you're active in politics and like Dr. Tharoor was saying, you don't have to become active politicians to be involved in the process. You know, you take stake, you stake your claim, ask questions, be actively involved. But if there are people who are willing and wanting to join active electoral politics, I mean, there's enough space for that. Uh, AIPC itself, I think is a platform that's wide enough. If you want to use it for a particular purpose, there's enough openness here. I don't think they have really put silos in AIPC that you can, cannot do that. You want to get involved 20 hours a day, you can do that. You want to do it once a week, you can do that. Depends on your involvement, uh, how much more you want to contribute. But the fact that you have a platform, you have an option, you have a venue where you can say and do things which you perhaps earlier were not able to do, that itself I think is a great beginning. That's right. Time is limited, so I won't add. Sir, uh, first of all, I congratulate you for having studied in... Uh, Wharton School having a national, international vision or global vision, then a national mission. And when it comes to implementation, you have been down to earth in Rajasthan and uh, taking the party forward and uh, bringing their morale and, and making it great. My question is uh, regarding education. It was said that uh, by Dr. Manmohan Singh that uh, for the educated people to get employed, we should have a GDP growth of more than 8% and which we have not been able to maintain. So how do we uh, make it possible for our GDP to consistently grow at 8% plus? And second question is regarding this engineering education, it was said that uh, Dr. Tharoor was saying there are more than 5 lakh engineers. I'm a chartered accountant. For the past 70 years, we have only 3.5 lakh chartered accountants in India. So don't you think that uh, more than the quantity, we should have a restriction and make the quality more important? Are you registered in the ICI? Yes, I have a chapter. No right. wonder you wanted to restrict it. <laughs> Sir, 
don't be afraid of competition the more accountants we have better it is and just that i will tell some of you the ici act was passed by the indian parliament in 1949 before the constitution was implemented so the accountants have had a say through parliament 1949 and the ici i happen to be a minister in that department for a couple of years so i'm telling you i am actually sir contrary to what you said i said accountants examination should be held in tier 2 tier 3 cities why only in kochi chennai bombay bangalore should happen in small towns and villages more and more people should get qualified and this i think we should not restrict the professionalism to a limited sphere of our society so societal changes happen when different people do different jobs today people from farming community are doing businesses so i think we have to be open about how much more quality we, i agree with you you have to have qualified and good quality people coming out of these professional institutions that's a paramount importance i think for our economy your earlier question about gdp growth at 8% i don't want to waste our time talking about this you vote for the hand symbol udf we'll have a government that'll give you 8% in delhi hello uh make it really quick because you don't have time i'm a 29 year old doctor from calicut city uh my question is very i uh, have actually two questions but very short one is directly to the congress party and mr tarus can answer this uh why is the congress losing the perception battle any government who's done all these blunders should be a cake walk for the opposition we saw what anazara did during the term of congress he had a same fast nobody even noticed the media is not covering any of this the mainstream media is completely silent and we all know they have not been bought and on twitter there are the journalists senior journalists who've been targeted and they have been replaced on their own shows so what is the congress doing in an era where nationalist governments are rising around the world what is the congress is stand to tackle this toxic environment of nationalism which has been used like how the romans used build the colosseum to distract the people against the troubles of the government what is that and the second question is a very personal question to sachin pilot sir this is because i wanted to meet you for a long time years back i don't know whether you remember in the today i had an article which said the young mps of congress are failing and today we have him sitting here on dais as deputy uh, uh, chief minister of rajasthan how did you transform that i just want a personal answer how did you transform from being so called written off by the entire national media to becoming the state where you are uh, fighting the change and actually becoming a beacon for young people like me who have want to join politics i let dr thiru answer the first part right. yeah how does what does the congress do to uh, counter this narrative frankly this is the big question of the election i mean we are trying to advance a counter narrative both pointing to the government's failures and to our own record of achievement and our vision for the future of the nation but being heard is tough it's tough partly for the reason you explain which is that the media has either been cajoled or cudgeled into submission and we have seen that part of the institutional challenge is that in our country a lot of the media owners have other business interests and that makes them vulnerable to government pressure that when we were in power we never saw fit to do because that would have been undemocratic but these people have no such scruples and there's been a lot of pressure we have seen stories critical of people close to the powers that be literally disappearing overnight from the websites of mainstream publications we have seen editors fired we've seen journalists dismissed and the question about how this country is going to advance in an atmosphere where all dissenting voices are silenced is a very fair question but because of this the media which was such a significant echo chamber for opposition voices when we were in power has become an echo chamber for the government's view of the truth which means the we rely more and more on alternative voices social media for example on word of mouth and on the effective campaigning amongst people to make them think afresh about what is in their own interest we can all be seduced by a good speech by uh, facebook memes by the chest thumping of the 56 in chest and so on but if the opposition makes you think for a minute what is in your own interest what is happening in your life how does voting for this person help you then maybe that kind of propaganda will no longer be enough it's something we'll only find out when the votes are ultimately counted but we've seen it in rajasthan we've seen it in madhya pradesh we have seen it in chatisgarh that people ultimately are prepared to wake up 
to act and vote in their own self-interest. And our job must be to remind people of their self-interest and let them choose for themselves what their self-interest is. I think it's well put. This is the test of our times. And I think young people, concerned individuals, and right-thinking Indians will do what is required for our country and not get swayed in by some of the propaganda that we see, especially on social media, and now increasingly so in the popular media. Uh, quick two comments about what you asked me. Frankly, I'm not aware I was ever written off, but if you said I was, then it's news. But winning and losing is part of life. What is important is that you don't forget who you are, where you come from, and why you're here. I was in government for five years. I was in opposition for five years. I did everything that I could do as an opposition leader. It was laticha, dharna, padarshan, fasting, gherao, rallies, foot marches, whatever I could do to raise issues. And I think if you remain connected, but sometimes people, when they come into office, somehow without knowing or perhaps unconsciously, they get cut off from the reality of the situation. If you're rooted enough, and that's something I learned from my late father, that fame, fortune, money, popularity will come and go. It doesn't matter. If people are attached to you and you feel for people that you represent, genuine feeling, it's not about making a speech or you know, putting up a post, to feel for people. If you have a live contact, then you can never be written off. And I think in India, opposition is almost as important as the government. So we have to keep focused as long as your ideas are clear, you're true to yourself, little bit compromise every individual has to make. In, in political life, fighting elections, living in this environment, you may have to compromise a little bit on what you really believe in, in terms of your principles. But largely, if your heart is in the right place, if you have feelings for the people that you want to work for, I think end of the day, you will succeed. You just have to be patient and very hardworking. Hello. It's a professional issue. I have to inaugurate the meeting of the National Dental Association. Oh, <laughs> the dentists are all waiting for me. Okay. But, but please. Okay. Thank you. Very brief. But first, uh, as a visitor back to my hometown, Trivandrum, may I uh, welcome Mr. Sachin Pilot to our part of the woods. And um, I hope when I come to Rajasthan, I can say hello. Uh, and when uh, Dr. Matthew said um, everyone's a professional here, I was relieved because he didn't say everyone's a politician. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tharoor, hello. Um, I don't know if you remember my name. No. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. Right. Pardon. You got it. Reshmi. Okay. Right. Mm, and uh, my question is very, very brief. Um, um, this is simply, we talked about artificial intelligence. Um, do you see artificial intelligence taking over seats of Lok Sabha? And Rajiv Sabha, if so, how many seats? And if so, will there be fewer politics in politics then? Do I see AI taking over parliament seats in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha? Some would argue that if that were happen, maybe we have more semblance of right decision making. But I don't see that happening quite yet, ma'am. Uh, but I do see that technology coming into our professional life and our businesses and so on. Uh, but you will have to, unfortunately, live with politicians for a bit longer. You'll have to suffer us, whether it's in parliament or in assemblies. So you can't get rid of all of us just yet. Sir, uh, sir, I would like to ask a question relating to education. So you've already stated that the job landscape in the country will change over the, say, the next 10 years. So for instance, me as a law student, I'm from GLC Trivandrum. As a law student, we still learn a lot of laws which are obsolete. So as a student, how can I tackle such an issue? while I'm imposed to study some laws which are already obsolete, while I have to practice another law. As a student, how can I address such an issue? I think the, I, I said right in the beginning, we'll have to rethink our curriculum. There's no reason why you should study a law that has already been obsolete and deleted. If it's only for information, you can see online, but it should not really, I think it should not be a part of the curriculum. Why must you mug up certain legislation that don't exist anymore? It's absolutely being not required, I think. Being a lawyer, I will quickly respond to that. See, it's obviously important that the syllabus has to be revised. But don't get uh, disappointed that you are learning some law which is obsolete because yeah, learning every law will open your perspectives of jurisprudence. And you will go through the uh, previous jurisprudence and all, which will make you a very good lawyer so don't get disappointed obviously, obviously that need to be a revision for that so we are running out of time i'm extremely sorry um and uh, we have two small things to be finished i'm 
you want asil you wanted to ask i think before we wrap up matthew i just want to say one thing i'll be failing in my duties if i don't encourage all of you especially people who are voters in chandram to please go out and vote for dr shashi tharoor in the next lok sabha elections i as a fellow congress person i know that he is deserving of your vote and this is an election not just to send him to parliament but also to send a message to new delhi that people with voices people who have thoughts people who have clarity people who are articulate people who represent and have so involved in functions and daily lives of people of trivandrum really i think you all deserve each other so go out there cast your vote it's not going to be an easy election there'll be muscle and money power coming in from delhi but please every single person irrespective of whether you are forward backward this religion that religion vote for the right person vote for dr tarus thank you